Hey guys, it is week eight and I wanted to help you out a little bit with the Romeo and Juliet Act 2, Scene 2, uh, aka the famous uh, balcony scene. Uh, just to kind of remind you, the Chromebooks have been having some issues, uh, so please make sure that you're restarting your Chromebook um, every now and then. And also, if you're struggling to use the PDF, I'm very sorry. Um, here's a link though to the online PDF as well, and that might be better to use. Okay. Also, I've been kind of doing a little code word um, thing for my videos just to see who's kind of watching and I give you a point or two. So if you are watching, you can send me an email with this code word or write it on the comments for this week's assignments, a private comment. The code word for this video is may. Okay, I just want to give you a point or two for taking the time to kind of review this and read this together with me. All right, so let me scroll down to where we're at with Act 2, Scene 2. And from the reminder that we had Romeo and Juliet who had went, um, her, the Juliet Capulet household was holding a feast and Romeo joined and they fall in love and they kiss um, and they seem to be very serious about each other. Um, Romeo was at first though heartbroken about Rosalind, but then once he went to the feast and met Juliet, he kind of seemed to have forgotten all about that. Then we kind of closed the scene before this with Romeo's friends, um, Mercutio and Benoglio kind of talking about what is going on with Romeo because Romeo kind of sneaks off and we don't know where he's at. And then as we read Act 2, Scene 2, we'll see where he went. All right, so let me scroll down here. Oh, I'll scroll down a little bit more. Sorry, guys, it always takes me a minute. There we go. Okay, so there's quite a bit of figurative language that Romeo and Juliet are going to use, and that's kind of what the goal was for some of your assignment this week. Again, figurative language kind of gives more imagery, and we can kind of get to see in a more creative way what is being said, but that sometimes makes us kind of slow down and look at what is that maybe comparison of two unlike things. What is being said with this, with this exaggeration? And then that kind of helps us see some more about the situation. Okay, so we've got Romeo, and he kind of snuck off, and they're in the Capulet's orchard. So that means that he actually snuck off, and he's back at Juliet's house. So Romeo, it says, coming forward, he just had scars that never felt a wound. So basically, this is saying right here that he had heard his friends in the previous scene teasing, and um, he's not thinking about it right now. So then enter Juliet at a window. So he's kind of down below. And he's sneaking into the garden, kind of outside her bedroom window of Juliet's house. So this is what Romeo says as he sees her. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who's already sick and pale with grief. Though thou her, her, though thou her maid art far more fair than she, be not her maid since she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green. And none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. So let me backtrack just a little bit because Romeo is basically kind of gushing about just how wonderful Juliet is. So let's kind of go through this line by line. So it says, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. This is a very famous line. So basically he sees Juliet coming and stark from inside um, to kind of like the balcony. And he's saying like, oh, what light is that? Because she's just so gorgeous. She's just like lighting up his world, the sky. And he says, it's the east and Juliet is the sun. So we're comparing Juliet to the sun. So this is a metaphor. It's a comparison of two unlike things. Juliet's not really the sun, but if he, what do we know about the sun? Well, the sun is bright. It gives light. It helps a lot of things grow. So for him, he thinks Juliet's beauty and just her general personality it's like the sun, it brightens up his life. He continues to then even talk more about her and her beauty. He's pretty smitten. So he says, arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, though thou her maid are far more fair than she. So he's basically saying that she compares and brightens more than the moon. So comparing like the moon to other ladies. So compared to Juliet, no one stands a chance because she's just so gorgeous and lovely and wonderful. This is kind of also showing us that Rosalind is definitely not on his mind anymore, even though he was very heartbroken in the um, beginning of this play. 
Okay, as we continue going, and that's what he's talking about here about how the moon is envious. It says, it is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eyes disclose and I will never answer it. I'm too bold. Tis not to me she speaks. Two of the faintest stars in all the heaven, having some business, do entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres till they return. What if her eyes were there, they in her head? The brightness of her cheeks that shame those stars. As daylight does a lamp, her eyes in heaven. Would thou the airy region stream so bright? The birds would sing and think it was not night. So he sees her and he says that she's not speaking, yet he can just tell by her expressive eyes that she must be thinking all of these things. He wishes he knew what it was. Then he also compares her eyes to the like, beautiful spears and how lovely they are and how they twinkle. And he talks about the brightness and loveliness of her cheeks and how even the stars don't stand a chance and just how wonderful that she is um, and how birds would even sing at her if it was not like nighttime. So again, he's kind of just hanging out, watching Juliet from afar as she's on her balcony. He continues to say, see how she leans her cheek upon that hand. Oh, that I wear a glove upon that cheek, that I much touch that cheek. So he's even saying, man, I just wish I could be near her, closer to her. And then Juliet is going to start to speak. Now, she does not know that he is there. So she's going to be revealing some private feelings and he's going to hear Ah me. And so basically ah me means oh my. She speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel, for thou art as glorious to the night, being over my head, as a winged messenger of heaven, unto the white upturned wondering eyes of mortals that fall back to gaze on him, when he bestrides the lazy puffing clouds and sails upon the bosom of the air. And so here he's actually using a simile. And so when he says that she speaks, Speak again, bright angel, for thou art as glorious to the night. So he's saying she's as glorious and as beautiful, a simile here, as like an angel. And he kind of just wants to hear what she has to say again. Uh, we have like the imagery of the lazy, puffing clouds that are going on um, as mortals just fall on their backs and just want to hear what she has to say because she's just so wonderful. So he's saying you're as glorious as an angel. Um, he's definitely very much as smitten with Juliet. So here's what she'll say in private, not knowing he's there. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if that will not be, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. So this is a very, very famous line. So basically, she is talking about Romeo in public um, or in private, um, but kind of revealing her feelings here. She's saying like, Romeo, Romeo, you are, why do you have to be a Montague? Why are you Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse that name is saying, can you like get a new name? Do you have to be associated with your family since our, our families are enemies? Or if you cannot do that and you swear you love me, then I'll just no longer be a Capulet and I'll be with you. So she's very kind of just shot and upset about the conflict that these families are having. So again, this whole time, Romeo's in the bushes, kind of a little creepy, um, watching her. So she doesn't know he's there. So he's still kind of listening and talking to himself. So he says, shall I hear more? And shall I speak at this? And she continues, tis but thy name that is my enemy. Though art thou myself, though not a Montague. What's a Montague? It is not hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be but some other name. What's in a name? That is what we call a rose by any other name would smell sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes. Without that title, Romeo, doff thy name. And for that name which is not part of thee, take all myself. So she's still kind of talking about his name. And, you know, because their families are mortal enemies. So she is saying, like, is it just a name? I mean, what is a name? Maybe you could not be a Montague. I mean, it's just your family's name. Is it really mean that reflects you as a person? Or are you different from that? Do you have to be associated with that? And she says that he is just perfection and it doesn't matter of the name. Um, and she just wants him to, like, be hers. So trade your name to be with me or I'll trade everything and be with you. So she's very crazy about him as well. And so then Romeo 
<laughs> so all of a sudden I'm going to start talking. So he says, I take thee at that word, call me but love, and I'll be newly baptized. Henceforth, I will never be Romeo. So he says, oh, well then I will take you and we'll be together. Just call me love and say that you love me and I will be newly baptized, meaning I will take a new name. I'll never need Romeo. So if that's what you need, I will not have my last name. I'll do whatever it takes to be with you. It doesn't matter what's going on with our families. And then, well, Julia didn't know he was there while well, she's kind of speaking in private, so she's going to respond. What man are thou that's beseeched in the night, so stumbleth on my counsel? So she's kind of like embarrassed, like who is there, like alone at night, listening to me? By a name, I know not how to tell thee who I am. My name, dear saint, is hateful to myself because it's an enemy to thee. Had I had it written, I would tear the word. So he's saying, I don't want to tell you my name because that's the problem, who I am. And she says, my ears have yet not drunk a hundred words of thy tongue's uttering, yet I know the sound. Are thou not Romeo and a Montague? So she's saying here, it's kind of an exaggeration, or kind of like um, a hyperbole in a way, but really it's more personification too. She's saying, my ears have not yet drunk a hundred words. So your ears can't really drink, but she's saying, I have not heard even you speak a hundred words to me, yet I already know your voice. So again, this is personification would be the best element here. And she's saying, I already know who you are. You're Romeo. And so then they continue the conversation and Romeo goes, neither fair nor maid, if either the alike. And she says, how come thou hither? Tell me and wherefore the orchard wall, orchard walls are high and hard to climb. And the place death, considering who thou art, if any of my kinsmen, kinsmen would find thee. So she's asking, like, how did you get here? You had to climb. There's huge walls to climb. And it's very dangerous if you were to be found out by my relatives um, being an enemy's family. And he says, with love's light wings did I approach these walls. For stony limits cannot hold love out. And for what love can do, that dares, that dares love to tempt. Therefore, thy kinsmen are no stop to me. So he's saying... Um, and personifying love. And he's saying love's wings are what helped him get through and gave him the power <laughs> to come to her um, house. And he's saying that, you know, nothing can touch him. He needs to see her um, regardless of the threat of her kinsman. And she says, if they do see thee, they will murder thee. Alack, there lies more peril in thy eyes than 20 of their swords. Look thou, but sweet, and I am proof against their enmity. So he's saying that I really don't care if they want to kill me or not. What would be worse is if you were to not look at me sweetly, if you didn't like me. That would kill me worse than actually the swords and um, the weapons of your family members. It's pretty intense. So Juliet says, I would not for thy words they saw thee there. And he says, I have knights' cloaks to hide me from their eyes. And but love, and but thou love me, then let them find me here. My life is better ended by their hate than their death protonged, wanting of thy love. So he's saying that he is hidden and it's okay. And that um, if she loves him, then that's wonderful and he's there. Um, and then if, and if they end his life by hate, so be it, because he at least is with his love. But whose direction foundest thou out this place? So how did you get here? And he says, by love, that first did prompt me to inquire. So he's saying that love helped him find his way. He let me counsel, and I let him eyes. I'm no pilot yet, where there thou as far. As thou thou sure washed with the farthest sea, I should venture for such merchandise. So I'd go any lengths to find you. Love would direct me to you. And she says, Thou knows the mask of night is on my face. Else would, would, that, would a maiden brush be paint my cheek. For thou, which thou hast heard me speak tonight, fain would I dwell in form, fain, fain deny, what I have spoke but farewell compliment. Dost thou love me? I know that will say I, and I will take thy word. Yet if thou swears it, they may prove false at lovers' perjuries. They say love laughs, so gentle Romeo. If thou dost love, pronounce it faithfully. So she's saying up here um, that... The night is kind of blocking her face. So you can't see the color, but like she's blushing because what she was speaking, like Romeo, Romeo, those lines, she wasn't meaning for anyone to hear. And she was very like straightforward because she thought she was in private, kind of like a girl writing in her journal or diary, anyone writing their diary. And she was saying it aloud about how she really felt. And, and if she was maybe speaking to him in, in person, she might not be that straightforward. She might try to play more hard to get about it. 
but he has heard. And so she's going to admit it. She loves him already. And she wants to know if he agrees and not just agrees, but will he actually like swear and um, be serious about agreeing back to her love? So she says, if thou dost love, pronounce it faithfully. Or if thou thinks I'm too quickly won, I'll frown and be perverse and say they nay. So thou will well woo, but else not for the world. And truth, fair Montague, I'm too fond. And therefore, thou more think my heavier light. But trust me, gentlemen, I'll prove more true than those that have more cunning to be strange. I should have been more strange, I must confess. But thou overheard, or, or I was warrior, my true love passion. Therefore, pardon me, and not impute this yielding to light love, which thou dark night hast so discovered. So again, she's saying, excuse me, don't assume that I'm just so easy to get, but I just love you so much, and it is so serious. Um, and so she's a little nervous about kind of having all of her feelings out there. And so she wants to know if he feels the same way. And he says, lady, by yonder blessed moon I vow, that tips with silver all those fruit tree tops. So he's saying, by the moon, that I vow my love. Yes, um, I do love you. And so he's trying to say, like, swearing by the moon, like, to show my love. And she says, oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon, that monthly changes in our circular orb, lest thy love prove thy glyce variable. So she says, the moon is always changing. That's not something you want to swear by. And he says, what should I swear, swear by? To show I'm, like, serious here. She said, do not swear at all. Or if thou wilt swear, swear by thy gracious self, which is the god of my adult ideology. And I'll believe thee. If my heart's dear love, well, do not swear. Although I joy in thee, I have no joy of this contract tonight. It is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden, too like the lightning with dust cease to be, ere one can say it white the lightens. Sweet, good night. The bud of love by summer's ripening breath may prove a beaut beauteous flow when next we meet. Good night, good night. A sweet repose and rest. Come to thy heart as thy within my breast. So she's saying, um, you know, just swear by yourself. And if you do love, and he says that he does love her. And she says that she has great joy in that, but there's not going to be a contract tonight. So she's saying we're, we're not going to get married or make any vows tonight. And that this is getting too rash or too fast all of a sudden. And that it needs to be something, and she's kind of comparing it to the bud of love, summer's ripening breath, may prove a beauteous flow when we next meet. So she's saying this will grow kind of like a flower. And the more that they meet each other, their love will keep growing. But they just need to take some time. And then Romeo replies, oh, will thou leave me so unsatisfied? So he's not happy with her response. And she says, well, what satisfaction can thou have tonight? So she's saying, well, what do you want? And he says, the exchange of thy love's faithful vow for mine. So he wants her, that love's faithful vow for mine, he wants her to marry him. And she says, I gave thee mine before thou didst request it. And then I'll give it to you again. She says, well, I give you my love. Um, I vow to be with you. And if you want, I would even say it again. So yes. And he said, will thou withdraw it? For what purpose, love? But to be frank and to give it thee again. And yet I wish for the thing I have. My bounty is as boundless boundless as a sea. My love is deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. So she's saying that her love for him is so serious. And the more that she loves him, the more that she's going to feel. And it's true and it's deep. And so yes, of course, she um, kind of vows this. And so she says, I hear some noise within. Dear love, adieu. Anon, good nurse. Sweet Montague, be true. Stay but a little and I will come again. So her nurse is calling for her. So she has to go kind of see what's going on. And he says, oh, blessed, blessed night. I'm afeard. Being a knight, all this is but a dream. Too flattering sweet to be substantial. And so he's saying, I can't believe this is real. And she said three words. So three words is like, I love you. Dear Romeo, good night indeed. If thou thy bent of love be honorable, thy purpose marriage, send me word tomorrow by one that I'll procure to come to thee, where and what time thou wilt perform to the right, and my fortunes at thy foot I'll lay. So she's saying, I love you. Good night. And if you are being honorable and your purpose is honorable and for marriage, then let me know tomorrow and I will um, kind of go along with your plan and let me know what time you would like to get married. So we definitely moved kind of quickly, uh, to say the least, um, and follow thee, my Lord, throughout the world. And then she's saying, I will follow you wherever uh, you tell me to go. And so then we hear the nurse again going, Madam, and Juliet says, I come anon. Be thou meanest not well, I do beseech thee. So she's still a little nervous about his um, intentions. And so we hear the nurse going, Madam, 
by and by I come. So she's trying to get the nurse to know that she's coming to cease thy strife and leave me to my grief. Tomorrow I send. So thrive my soul a thousand times. Good night. A thousand times a word to want thy light. Love goes toward love's a schoolboy from their books. But love from love towards school with heavenly looks. So he, or with heavy looks. Is he saying that he's, um, can't wait. It's kind of like a schoolboy who can't wait to kind of like go home um, instead of going to school. He is wanting to, uh, he cannot wait until he kind of gets to see Juliet again and they get to declare their love and their vows of marriage. And she says, hist, Romeo, hist. Oh, for a falconer's voice to lure the tassel great back again, bondage his horse and may not speak aloud. Else would I tear the cave where Echo lies and make her airy tongue more hoarse than mine with repetition of my Romeo. So she's saying that his name is going to be on her um, like lips over and over again because she's going to be thinking about him. And he says, it is my soul that it calls, calls upon my name. How silver sweet sound lovers' tongues by night, like softest music to attending ears. And so he's basically saying, my soul knows you and, and we're in love and I'm, I'm so glad that you'd call for me. And so he, she goes, Romeo. And he goes, my sweet. Um, and he, she says, what o'clock tomorrow shall I send to thee? And he says, by the hour of nine, I will not fail till 20 years till then. I forgot why, why I did call thee back. Let me stand here till thou remember it. I shall forget to have love till stand here, remembering how I love thy company. And I'll stay to have thee still forget, forgetting my other's homes but this. Till's almost morning, I would have thee gone, and yet no farther than a wanton's bird, then let it hop a little from his hand, like a poor prisoner to his twisted gyves, and with a silken thread pluck its back again, so loving jealous of his liberty. I would, I were thy bird. So basically it is getting late. It's almost, I think, going to be sunrise soon. And she's letting him know what time to come um, to kind of get their marriage going tomorrow. And then talking about how he wishes he was a bird and could just be around her. And this time apart is going to seem like 20 years. So she says, sweet, so would I. Yet I'll kill thee with so much cherishing. Good night, good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I should say good night till it be tomorrow. And so she exits and he goes, sleep, dwell upon thy eyes, peace in thy breast. Would I sleep in peace so sweet to rest? Hence will I have to my ghostly frere's close cell, his help to cave and my dear hap to tell. So he is going to leave and go to his frere, um, kind of like a priest, to kind of figure out how they are going to go about getting married. Uh, so as you can tell with this act we have in this scene, things have moved quite quickly. And we will see what happens um, with Friar Lawrence in the next act. All right, guys, this is Act 2, Scene 2. Again, the code word that you can email to me is MAY, um, and that can give you a point or two for watching the video. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, again, with a figurative language, just spend a little bit of time to see kind of what they are saying about each other and their love uh, in this scene. All right, miss you all terribly. Bye-bye.